growing up, I was surrounded by music and, and theatre. Uh, my father was in, as it was an opera singer, and we used to get taken to rehearsals and performances. And as a family, of we were all following him in the early days through Europe. You know, books were encouraged our house and fairy tales and the grim fairy tales and mythologies and things like that. So I think that world drew me, but it wasn't until I was maybe 15 when someone said, well, you know, you can actually do this as a real job, which is saying something, <laughs> you know, cause it's a real job. And and I'd just been working backstage doing a lot of scenic painting and, and that sort of work. So I sort of found my way skirting around it and then, um, you know, chose this path directly, really, I suppose. And at the time it felt easier to choose that over, you know, maybe production design and things, but some production designers, they always say to me, oh, you're so lucky. I don't, I'm so lucky I don't have to deal with actors. <laughs> Folk like that, you shouldn't be. It's not hot. Fine, it's not hot. Concentrate the fact that there's a giant in there. She's making that face, not that face, Nori. Nori! Nori, don't! I had been working exclusively in theatre and opera and then there were a few um, uh, opportunities when I was living in the UK. You know, you meet one person, you meet another person. I started doing some um, smaller films. In fact, um, one of my first films on a clear day is with um, Peter Mullen and Brenda Blethyn and it's just little connections too, all these little connections. But the biggest opportunity really was when I came back to New Zealand with my daughter to live and, you know, um, I met... Peter Jackson through Philippa and Fran and the boys at Weta and um, it's amazing that the biggest opportunity actually happened at home and I'm I'm very grateful to them because they sort of gave me a chance. I think they had a lot of names on their list and it went through a series of processes and interviews and that eventuated in being asked to become part of the team, you know, because we all sort of had to go through all these closed corridors, and that's quite exciting, really. And um, and so that's how it came to be about. We were dealing with time in a different way in and in a different place, and I think to understand that arc of, say, 6,000 years, I'm just throwing that loosely out there, <laughs> There's a lot of times and dates in this world. So I um, familiarised myself with the world of the Silmarillion, which is very different in tone to everything else. But I think you have to understand where characters are coming from, where they begin and how um, their path eventuates. And there's a real shift in between the ages that you also have to understand um, the Lord of the Rings world. Magic is fading and it's the time of man. And in this world... It's the it's the opposite effect. The trees still give light, and I, I so that that was the understanding of the books. And there's a lot that's written. There's so much that's written. So there's a lot to do with the reflections of stars and water, and those are the sort of elements. There's also this beautiful description he has for elven cloaks that we see in Lord of the Rings, you know, that they're almost used as camouflage, you know, the sort of way um, he describes elven magic is almost like illusion in some ways. So it was all about using reflections and light um, to try and express those. And when we look at um, the Silmarillion, there's a, a lot of discussion about jewels and and 
the wearing of all of this sort of wealth and, and the description of using pearls and things like that. So I sort of brought those into the costumes, but it was to try and create an organic feeling reflecting those elements. Also sort of silks and things that would um, give light. And um, even with the cloaks that we used for Aaron Deer in his more workmanlike world and the cloaks in the Northern Waste, they were all there to reflect the colours of the environment that they were in. So to offer that sort of shape-shifting world. The doors are interesting. It was very much um, that this was the um, Bayona and the uh, showrunners, Patrick and JD, discussed this as being the golden age of dwarves and elves. And when you read Gimli's description of Khazadum before the devastation that we see in Lord of the Rings, there's beautiful stories of reflection and light. They're not always the doer. Um, creatures that we know, except, you know, again, when you go to their creation, back to their creative source, they're the children of Aule and, you know, the fire is in their eyes. And I use all of these things as inspiration, you know, the, the, the myth that they return to stone when they die and all of those things. We did use lots of stones and, um, you know, jeweled stones and things that we sewed in and sort of pleating to give them a more sculptural look. We used um, gilding and things like it had brushed off the mines onto their clothes or that clothes were scorched in the soot from the um, the mines and the anvils and that world. We used all of those things in different elements according to which group of doors we were dealing with, yeah. They were quite a treat to start working on, you know, in this sort of their nomadic people on their journey and sit between, um, you know, on their travels. We were looking at that line between the mountain peaks and the tree line. And I was looking at, um, you know, all sorts of nomadic people, but also, you know, um, peat workers and all of that. And it sort of, you know, we're trying to find a way of unifying this tribe who weren't as fat and content as our lovely beloved Shire folk in, in the world of The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings. And physically, it, it always comes back to the physicality and we're also dealing with scale in this case as we were with the dwarves. And um, it was rooting their world in, in another kind of camouflage. They were in a dangerous world. Um, and so, um, you know, we made these cloaks and sort of clan plaids, if you want, that were sort of actors' coverings. And um, it was the the idea behind it was really that if they were in the middle of a field and sat still, you couldn't really um, see them unless they chose to see you. And using the colours from vegetable dyes and the world around them, the soot from, um, you know, campfires. And there were also elements, um, Bayona was very keen to... Um, you know, with Middle Earth, there's this, always this wonderful thematic thing of uh, generations before, past and gone in the ruins of other civilizations, layered and layered through the history. So we had the um, the sort of idea that maybe, you know, when they camped over another old ancient battlefield, you know, we sit between these two great wars and, you know, things like old uh, coins or arrowheads and things like that became little sources for cloak pins and decorations, but also to help with scale. And we use, the, they're sort of like our pagan incest ancestors in many ways, you know, they're sort of the more human in terms of um, the common man of us. And we use things like um, fruits and berries and played with that as a scale a thing to help us with these, you know, the scale of these characters and that, so that you were um, trying to always make the audience aware of the size of them. Well, Numenor was interesting because they've got this um, direct link to the elves of the first stage, and they were um, on the side of. Um, on that side, you know, during the um, first Great Wars. So we, in, in the language of, as the language of the production design evolved, it was about adding those layers of ancient layers of elven threads through that and then putting in the new language of Numenor as it became its own thing and their power. And there's definitely a very much a sort of Greek Roman um, sort of feel to that world. And but we did link it thematically with colours, you know, some of the blues and things that you see with the colour palette of the elves and introduce the corals and things. And so sometimes materiality shifts according to who you're um, looking at within the culture and that. But there's definite links with both cultures. So the biggest challenge is sort of trying to wrangle all of all of this great, there's no shortage of material. And um, I think it's a multiple factor of challenges and they're all ex 
usually quite exciting, but there's always the con constrictions of time or the challenges of time and, and working with all the other departments. I think it's the, the whole, you know, I'm just one element and then the actor brings their own element to it. So it, it's an evolving thing. And um, I just love being um, thrown into these worlds and being able to be creative within them and create a language. I love that part of the process. And I love working with actors and, you know, you, um, the end result is because of the journey that you all make together with your director and that it's not, you know, I might have an idea, but the journey itself is the interesting part.